check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Chad Smith Podcast. My name is Chad Smith, and today is Tuesday, September 27th, 2022, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host from California. Please welcome Sonny Conway and Spooky Morales. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning, boys. Good morning. How are you guys doing over there? Oh, it's it's nice. 67 right now. Good. Not not going not really through a heat well. wave anymore. Yeah. Oh, That's man, good, I'm just man. having my coffee, and I have myself a little pumpkin cream cheese muffin with my coffee this morning because it's spooky season a pumpkin cream cheese that's right i had a little sugar something okay. i don't usually do <laughs> all right <laughs> understandable that's cool sounds really good though i would like to say good morning to everyone in the chat that's joined us so far this morning and all the amazing people we got somebody with a birthday oh yeah actually uh let's take care of that real quick terry brown i noticed that it was your birthday and you're a member of the chad smith podcast and uh, you've always been very supportive of us, so I made this for you last night. Happy birthday. That Terry Brown. so nice. Happy Terry birthday, Brown, man. man. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to Terry Brown. And, uh, yeah, we got a bunch of cool people in the chat already, looks like. And we have somebody awesome backstage, so we don't want to keep him waiting. No, no. For the third time to the Chad Smith Podcast. Yeah. Please welcome back. <laughs> Please welcome back, Preston Dennett. How's it going, sir? Going great. Going great, great. Preston, guys. Very Preston. good. Doing very good. So we asked you uh, at the start of the, or before we got started, but um, I noticed that you're not in your normal studio that you're normally in. So did you uh, take a little move? I did. Yeah, it was time to get out of L.A. Yeah. That's cool. So where are you located now? Or we don't have to share that, but where did you move to? <laughs> Undisclosed location. Yeah. Yes. Undisclosed at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out in the wilderness. Let's put it that way. Surrounded by oh. national forest. Oh, that Ooh. sounds awesome. You got a oh. guest house? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to. Uh, it's a lot deeper out of L.A. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be awesome to have a big house like that in the woods and have a bunch of little cabins you could rent out or Airbnbs or something. Yeah, just I got out just in time. It was 110 degrees, I think, when I Ooh. left. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that is crazy. I can't even imagine. I don't think it's ever been that hot over here in Michigan. <laughs> 110. <laughs> that is nuts. Yeah, in the valley, it gets like an oven. Yeah, Man, I, don't I can't. Make it. But it's a dry heat, you know. They say it's a dry heat. <laughs> yeah, we've had some weird, humid uh, weather this uh, summer. Very weird. Oh, that's strange. Yeah, Sonny, you guys stay real dry over there, don't you? It doesn't oh, ever get. Yep. There's a humidifier running in the living room right now. <laughs> Whoa! We only run humidifiers in the winter time. That's strange to hear. <laughs> so anyway, Preston. So you are working on. Uh, you're always writing books and you've got a new book out it's called symmetry a true ufo adventure you guys can check that out on amazon i'm putting the link in the chat right now and it'll be in the description after the video but can you just tell us a little bit about that new book that you've got out yeah yeah sure thanks chad um it is obviously a true story it's, um, it's a bit different from some of the other books i've written which are sort of collections of UFO stories. This is really one person's story. Her name is Dolly Safran. She's a former nurse, a Department of Defense worker, really good witness, who's had lifelong contact with UFOs and ETs. She reached out to me in 2016. Uh, and her story is probably the most extensive I've ever had the opportunity to investigate. She's had hundreds and hundreds of encounters. She's been able to photograph the UFOs, film them. She's got lots of corroborating witnesses, medical evidence. And what's really cool about her case is she has no fear of this stuff. 
and she has not needed hypnosis to, re you know, recover lost time or missing time. She remembers everything and says that since age 14, pretty much, is when she kind of woke up to it, uh, has been taken on board and actually taught her how to fly the craft. They've taken her to other planets. It's a crazy story when you think about it in its totality. Uh, but I can't say it's not entirely unique. I mean, having interviewed hundreds of people, other people have told me pretty much all these things, but very much sort of piecemeal. And she's got a continuous narrative and it's still ongoing. Uh, it's really an amazing story. Oh, wow. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard of somebody getting to fly the craft yet. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh -huh. Yeah, when she told me that, I'm like, wow. Um, it was at age 14 when it really began for her. She was, let's see, this was in the Everglades, 1973. And uh, she'd had a lot of you know, missing time stuff and seeing UFOs and odd dreams at night and people visiting into her bedroom and things like this. But one evening it was around 1 a.m. She's out there in her backyard with her telescope and her dad, an army ranger, uh, who turns out is also a contactee. It's a generational thing. He turns to her and says, you know, come inside. It's a school night. <laughs> it's too late. Get to bed. And uh, she goes to bed and doesn't sleep much. So she's just sitting by the window looking up at the stars when she sees a bunch of stars moving around. And she starts looking up at them, and it's like 50, 50 or 100 of them, a lot. And she's like, oh, my God, it's happening again. Uh, this time I'm going to remember because she was used to this. You know, every time they would come down, she would black out. And sure enough, one of them drops down right over her house. And she sees it's a metallic craft. It's maybe 50 feet over her house, right above the tree there. She can see two little portholes and looking through the portholes are, you know, what we call grays. And that freaked her out. She's like, oh, my God, they're not human. This is really happening. And she turned to dive under her bed. And that's when her room filled with light. And she did black out. She woke up the next morning, four hours, five hours later. And she was not wearing her pajamas. She was wearing someone else's pajamas. They were on inside out and backwards. So that gave her pretty solid evidence that this was absolutely a real experience. She wasn't imagining it. She wasn't going crazy. And she went down or she went to the kitchen uh, to talk to her mom who was making breakfast and asked her, oh, did you see anything last night? Her mom hated this subject because Dolly kept disappearing from the house. They'd have to call the police, ended up you know, putting double locks on the doors and buying guard dogs, but nothing would stop these experiences and her mother whirls around and says what are you talking about and dolly says ufos and her mom just flipped out and uh, at that point the news comes on and started reporting sightings in their area police officers had seen them so dolly's like see see i told you and uh, her mom says get out of the kitchen now and her dad walks in and says go to the bathroom you know you need to meditate on this because uh, he had heard the whole conversation looking back in hindsight, Dolly realized that he knew exactly what was going on, that she had been taken. So she starts going into the bathroom and meditates and she remembers, she recalled the whole experience. And what she recalled was this beam of light coming down, Gray's coming into her bedroom. She's pulled on board and there was this tall Gray who she recognized because her memories are flooding back in. She remembered seeing uh, this tall gray before and other smaller shorter grays she pukes immediately uh, they clean her up and uh, start talking to her it says you know calm down it's okay we're not going to hurt you you're going to be just fine and uh, gave her a long conversation and actually took her gave her a tour of the craft this is what they often will do if you don't have a strong fear reaction and brought her up to the helm, the control room. He said, do you want to take a ride? She said, sure. And they sat her down in the seat and they said, you can fly it if you want and showed her how to do it. And they took her, and this sounds crazy, to Saturn, planet Saturn. And we're showing her the rings and the moons. 
when, when Dolly told me this, I'm like, damn, this is exactly what Jay Gardner told me. He's a contactee from West Virginia. And he was 12 years old when he had the same experience. A UFO landed outside of his house, he was pulled on board, and they took him to see the planet Saturn. So, uh, and I know of other cases, this happened to Raymond Fowler, a UFO researcher. So as crazy as it sounds, it's not unique. Do you think that that might be just because that that's a planet that we all recognize and like maybe we wouldn't recognize Mars or uh, the difference between Mars or Venus or something like that, but Saturn, everyone knows the Saturn has uh, rings, you know, the, is that maybe why they take you there is because it's like they want to prove to you that they're, you're really out there? Yeah, 100%. I think it's immediately recognizable. I think, that, in fact, that's what they basically told her. Like, do you recognize this planet? Which she did. You know, she was already into astronomy. And uh, it was, yeah, it's got a very striking appearance. Yeah. So I think that's kind of why they do it. But, you know, often they'll take people to the moon, too, or up to the moon. And that's what they did with her next. Uh -huh. <laughs> they took her and they started rotating around the moon. She says she saw the far side and that there were you know, structures there. And this is when they started talking to her saying, you know, what do you want to do with your life? You know, if you really want to work with us, we'd love to have you work with us. We're really happy that you're remembering and that you're not in fear. And Dolly said, I'd really love to learn how to fly these craft. And uh, they said, okay, we'll see if you're suitable for that. It's going to take some time. Uh, but if that's what you want to do, we're amenable to that. And I've had a number of people tell me this, that they've, you know, flown the craft or were given that opportunity. One guy, Ramon, a Navy medic, he had that experience, but he was too frightened. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not sitting down in the chair. Just take me home. <laughs> uh, which is like, eh, too bad. Wow. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. You made it that far, huh? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Be like, buckle up, boys. <laughs> <laughs> They taught her. She says it took her about four or five years. After that experience at age 14, they started coming once, twice a week, pulling her out of her bedroom, and they'd take her for hours at a time, always bring her back within a couple of minutes, usually, so they can kind of pull you right out of the time stream. Wow. And uh, we'd sit her down in this chair, and she says it's all flown mentally. It's all very much a psychic, empathic thing, and that the ship itself is to a certain extent, alive, as we would think of it. It's not wholly biological, but has mm -hmm. biological components, and it's embodied by a, an entity. And that was really interesting to hear her say, because I've had a lot of contactees tell me that they thought the craft was itself a living being. And uh, yeah, Dolly it's... was amazing to be able to fill in all the blanks and answer a lot of the questions I had about contact. I wonder if uh, I often wonder too if the the craft that we're seeing is just like a like an image that they're projecting into our minds because we recognize what a craft looks like or we recognize you know what a, a saucer shaped craft would look like or a space like we know what a spaceship would be so maybe in order for them to uh, kind of get us to know where we're at is we they have to make it look like a craft that we would recognize maybe. And maybe like the 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 alive part of it, or the um, the biological part of the craft, is really just <laughs> I don't know. Everybody says that we're all the same thing, like we're all the same entity, really, just experiencing life in different bodies. But yeah, they so, yeah. Kind of so a little bit. So it'd be like it'd be like your future self breaking it to you gently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kinda. If you believe in that kind of stuff. Right, right. Which I'm starting to kind of believe that kind of stuff. So it's like maybe the craft is really biological, but in order for it to look like a craft to us, they have to make it look like a saucer spaceship. I don't know that I would go that far. Um, it is interesting. I know that they can't change their appearance. Um, there was one mm -hmm. guy, a Marine officer. He had this helicopter drop down over him, and then it transformed into a UFO. And I've had a number of cases like that. And I asked Dolly about that because um, she says the craft can actually change appearance. You have the ability to shrink in size or expand, change color, shape. 
and she says, you know, the craft that she usually goes into is about 50, 100 feet, 200 feet. Um, it would change size. And mm -hmm. on the inside, it's much larger. And they have the ability to do this. She says it's very much like a, a cuttlefish. Because, and which made sense. I talked to another lady from Indiana. She was taken on board and she said it was the strangest thing because it looked like her living room. <laughs> there was a couch, there was a flat screen TV, an easy chair. Oh. She was looking out the window and there's just sky out there. And uh, in walks this 10 foot tall praying mantis. And uh, basically <laughs> held this device up against her neck and did this procedure. But she feels like they were able to change the shape of the craft to sort of um, reduce the fear factor. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in other uh, cases. They can basically make the interior look how they want it to look. And it's done through technology, a sort of a psychic hookup technology. But oh. they are ETs, they are craft. Uh, these, you know, we know this because, you know, cases like Roswell and the hundreds of others, these are a metallic craft. They leave landing traces, hundreds of landing trace cases where they're burning the ground to thousands of degrees classifying the sand, leaving radiation readings. Uh, hmm. we, we know, I mean, we reverse engineered these to a certain extent, if you believe all the whistleblower accounts. Right. You know, Preston, you brought up uh, the helicopter. You said it turned into a spacecraft. Yeah. I got a video one night from it's one of our fans. His name's Tim. And he sent me this video, and it was of a very low plane. And, and this guy walks to work every night. I guess he has to walk close to this airport to go to work. And he's telling me, you know, like, I see planes all the time. You know, and, and what I was looking at was not a plane. He said, I see them all the time. He goes, Sonny, it, it was like a disc. And when it got close to me, it turned into a plane. And, and it was a big plane. I seen the video of this thing coming at him. And then go over him, and he said it was not a plane. It, <laughs> he was so adamant about that that it it turned from a disc shaped object into a big ass passenger plane. That's what I was looking at. Yeah, I think uh, everybody should do that. I, I I didn't get to see it change. That's why he that I I got the phone call after the video, and he's telling me, you know, this this thing turned from a disc to a plane, and I had never heard that before. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of cases like that. And it goes even beyond that because they can make you think you're seeing a plane or even, I mean, there was one group of kids I interviewed, well, one of them I interviewed, uh, but he was with his friends. They're all teenagers. And he sees this saucer real close up, it's cut maybe 100, 200 feet away. And he's like, look, look, guys. <laughs> None of them could see it. He thought he was going crazy, but they could not see it. And he, you know, trying to, you know, pointing at it, rearranging their positions. They thought he was out of his mind. Uh, and I've got other cases like that where there's a group of people and some people are seeing it and others cannot see it. So I don't even know how to explain that. Hmm. Um, well, one guy that I mentioned him, the, the medic, Navy medic, he had that happen. He had a friend who was a contactee on the ship that he was on. <laughs> And his friends one day says, you know, I'm a contactee. They take me all the time. They've taken me since I was a kid. I've been on their ship to their planet. And Kevin's like, oh, yeah, if that's right. I think his name was Lewis. I'd like to meet your little green friends. And Lewis says, okay. <laughs> and comes back a couple of days later. This is still on the Navy ship. And says, I just went on board. And they said they'll come back for you. And they took me to your house. And he starts describing Kevin's house in detail which freaked Kevin out uh, because they were on, you know, on the ship in the middle of the Mediterranean or see, it was actually the near the Bermuda Triangle area. Now that I think of it, it was Atlantic. Hmm. Uh, and uh, this guy, Lewis, was describing Kevin's house as it was 10, 15 years earlier, <laughs> which freaked Kevin out even more because it was as if these guys had time traveled. But yeah. Long story short, uh, a couple of days go by and Lewis comes into the bunk room and says, okay, they're here. <laughs> you want to go up on deck? You can see them. 
and this is high noon. It's his lunch hour, and it's only a short walk to the top of the ship. And Kevin goes up onto the deck, and of course, there's you know dozens of people up there, and sees this huge, huge craft. It says it's about a quarter mile off the ship, bigger than the ship itself, which was 600 feet long. And he's freaking out, and he runs immediately to the closest guy there, which turned out to be the mess cook, and grabs him and tries to get his attention and can't. And the next thing Kevin knows, he's looking down at the Navy ship from below, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> and he's on board the UFO. And that, oh. began, you know, that began his encounter. And he was, yeah, he, they took him to the moon. And he says, he, he's looking down at the moonscape he didn't think it was the moon he thought and, it was, um, and this was the guy this was the guy that was being told the ship was up there he was just going to see it and now it's on yeah he said i'd like to meet your little green friends <laughs> so yeah he's, he said it you know I mean, his, his was a very benevolent encounter but he says it, it scared the crap out of him and uh yeah he's like oh no i'm a wall and they said no we're not even going to know you're missing <laughs> ended up taking him to the moon and he thought <laughs> we're hovering over Arizona or something, some bomb range until they came over the ridge and he saw Earth in the background. And that's when they really started talking to him telepathically. And they had a long conversation with him. He asked him all kinds of questions. Like, where are you from? And they, he said the room expanded in size. I remember, he looked at me, he was like, I don't even know how to <laughs> explain this to you, but the room changed size. I'm like, yep, I've heard that before. <laughs> They showed him the star chart and a little blinking red light off in the distance. And like, that's us. That's where we're from. And they wow. gave him the name of the star system. I asked him what it was. He's like, I can't pronounce it. I don't remember it. Uh, hmm. He ended up having a long conversation. He's like, what do you eat? He said, we eat fish and vegetables and things like this. He asked him about Roswell. They said, yes, that's real. They said that they're in touch with the major governments. Uh, and he's like, what do you look like? Because he was afraid to turn around and look at them. And they said, well, we're not little and we're not green. Uh, and our appearance sometimes frightens people. So he turned around and looked at them. And there was three of them. And they were praying mantis type ETs. And he said one of them got up from this little chair like thing and walked over to him. And this thing was easily twice his height, he said. He says, I'm six foot two. This thing was more than twice my height. It says it was 15 feet tall. And I'm like, mm, 15. Because you know, I usually hear maybe you know, seven feet tall. I got my <laughs> off out and sprayed that son of a bitch. Hey, that's with no 15 foot tall. Pray, man. You need a bigger can. <laughs> I don't even like little flies, man. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, it scared him back so yeah i said you want to go to our planet and he said no <laughs> bunch of you guys running around hell no i'm like why why would you go you know they they, they weren't hurting you or anything were they and he's like no no but you don't understand this thing was 15 <laughs> feet tall <laughs> sure me, me and chad i, I think I we weren't live me and chad were maybe just hanging out but i had him pull up a video not too long ago of this guy holding a prey mantis and it eating his thumb it's eating his thumb till it bleeds. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this guy's on drugs or if he just can't feel his thumb or what. But that's not the point. That prey mantis will eat you. So mm -hmm. there, I couldn't imagine one being fifteen feet tall instead of three inches tall. Yeah, I, that I, would be terrifying I, to me. I'm like, are you sure fifteen feet tall? Because usually, you know, I, I hear much shorter. He's like, listen, this was not only twice my height. Well, he's six two. Like a, yeah. <laughs> And yet he says, no, I didn't want to go to their planet. I felt like a bug next to them. <laughs> Ironically, wow. the bugs. But, but I didn't want to end up as, as a specimen. Felt like a bug among bugs. That's something. He said their eyeballs alone were the size of basketballs. Hopefully they don't have any human spray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, it was a friendly encounter, though. Is also, there... Do you know if there's a connect? I mean... It, we have those on Earth. So is there a connection to the praying mantises that we have and the ones that everyone is seeing in crafts? I think so. I asked Dolly about this because she's had the opportunity. She saw the various types of ETs. And they told her basically that genetics throughout the universe are very similar. 
that all beings have genetics. They're all humanoid. They all share very much the same genetics, but it just dials out differently, which is something I have kind of come to that conclusion at some point already, because they are all humanoid. And there are some that look just like us. And they basically explain that, yeah, they, she saw dog-like beings. I once talked to a lady who saw a cat-like being, and I wasn't sure <laughs> how to, if I, if I believed it, honestly. Her name was Sue. She described mm -hmm. a little four-foot-tall cat-like being with little ears and fur, the whole deal. And started to read about other accounts and uh, asked Dolly about that. She's like, yeah, I saw those once. Hmm. Preston, um, you just made me think of something when you said you weren't sure if you believed the cat lady. Um, how, what is the criteria you use when you decide if you believe somebody's reports or not? Uh, I, I remain very objective about it, first of all. It's because um, belief is one thing and knowing is another. And it's very hard to prove one person's case really at all until you experience it. So I just want to collect the information first. And if I think someone's, you know, pulling my leg, I'm not as interested. But yeah, there are certainly criteria you can use. Uh, like with Dolly, her case is very extensive. So I, I vet the witness. I will ask for, you know, uh, supporting witnesses. And, uh, if I'd like to talk to their family if possible and see if they have any thing to say about them. Are they telling stories? I will initially do a preliminary interview, which is not recorded. I'll just take notes and then I'll do a follow-up interview and see if their story changes. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of little details that you hear, which are perhaps well known in the UFO literature. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's getting harder these days because the subject is very popular. Because the reason I asked Preston, and it, um, I don't know if you follow uh, this um, disaster that's called uh, hashtag UFO Twitter. No. Good. Good for you. I'm very glad for you because it is um, the cesspool of the internet. <laughs> but the reason I ask is because um, I went back and was looking at some comments that people were saying on some of our shows and other shows that deal with like UFOs and such. And sometimes there's this people in these comments that say things like, the hosts don't ask tough enough questions. You, you guys just let your guests say whatever and you don't challenge them on it. And you know, my reaction to that is always the same thing. If you don't like what you're watching, don't watch it. Turn the channel, go look at something else. But then I also do think that there is sometimes that, you know, this thing, the reason I brought up you have a Twitter is because there's so much um, uh, trying to prove people to be uh, fakes and frauds and, you know, people that are lying to us. And this seems to be like a, I think it's a big phenomena inside the phenomena that we're talking about is that we just don't want to trust people and the stories they tell. We immediately go to wanting to prove them as, you know, as frauds and that, you know, they're trying to scam us. I think it's a defense mechanism that people use to, to try not to believe in things that, you know, their minds won't let them believe. But I just wonder what your thoughts are on why are so many people, you know, non-believers and they don't want to give us, give people the chance to, to tell their story. Yeah, I kind of get it because I came into this field as a skeptic. <laughs> I didn't believe any of it, not for a second. It was too Star Trek-y for me. <laughs> so how do people change that mindset? What does it take to, you know, open your mind up to other people's experiences and life stories? Because that's, I'm telling you, Preston, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Seven years old, you know, I experienced, I had near-death experience. I experienced all the phenomena and all my life I've gone through it all the way up until now. You know, in this story, this show is not about me, though. I just wanted to let you know from the from the base, ground base that, you know, I am a contactee experiencer and I find it very offensive that the first thing people want to do is call you a liar. And I found this community in YouTube over a year ago and I started to have a little bit of faith that maybe I could share some of the stuff that I've gone through in my life only to realize that Nothing's changed, man. Nobody wants to believe you. They just want to prove you to be a fake and a, and a fraud. And you know what that made me do? That made me curl back up and go back into that shell. And that's what I'm trying to tell people is that 
there are millions of people that have gone through these stories in their lives and had these experiences, but you're not hearing them because you scare people away. You make people not want to tell you for the fear of the ridicule. Exactly. Yeah, as a researcher, you have to be open minded. The, the people will not reveal their t t totality of their experience, often because there are b very bizarre and unbelievable details. Dolly is a good example. She was very wary, very tight lipped yep. uh, for a couple of years until she realized, you know, I'm not going to ridicule her. And uh, it's not at all unusual for people to tell me I have not told my spouse this. I don't do drugs. I have a good job. I've got no history of mental illness. Um, people will start weeping as they tell their story. This is one yeah. of the, the uh, you know, ways you can tell if a person is telling the truth, unless they're very good actors. Uh, but there's all kinds of ways you better witness. And uh, I think really the only way a person who's, you know, so skeptical they're married to it <laughs> is, is personal experience. Uh, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is that people remain skeptical is because this is a core belief. You know, it's like religion. It's like politics. It's like something that defines a person. It, it completely readjusts your worldview and your place in the universe to, you know, even consider the possibility that we're not at the top of the food chain or that we are not alone. So a lot of people just don't want to go there. And what I always challenge people to do is like, okay, you're skeptical. That's fine. I get it. I dare you. I challenge you to ask the people you love and trust who, you know, aren't going to lie to you, family, friends, coworkers, everyone's got at least a couple of people around them and ask them if they've had any experience. And I bet you that you will find someone you love and trust who has not told you the truth about what has happened to them. That's, that's how it happened with me. I found out my brother had had an encounter, two sister-in-law. Uh, I had a couple of friends, um, people at work. It was shocking. And uh, that I, is what I would tell people. If you are truly skeptical and are interested, I dare you. And if you want to see a UFO, it's not that hard. It's a matter of going outside and looking for them. Exactly. Um, Dude, I, I try to tell people. Well, after a long, it took me a long, long time to get to this place, but it's like, you want me to prove to you after what I've been through, I'm challenging you to prove to me what I went through was not real. You tell me it wasn't fucking real. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. I was saying, just like, prove it. I'm like, wait a second. It's up to you to gain your own knowledge. That's not my job. <laughs> you have to build your own. Is this mic screwing up for you guys? Yeah, it doesn't sound good. I want to hear what he's saying so bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. your mic started cutting out there for a minute. Oh, sorry. Oh, there it went. Oh, there we go. Hey, Hey, Preston, I, sometimes I use this um, way of uh, comparing it. Uh, when I was younger in my uh, family, and I have a big family, um, there was an, a, a situation where a young girl, very young, under 10, she went and tried to tell her, uh, my uh, aunt and uncle, that another family member had been abusing her sexually. They didn't want to believe her. Oh, that's fucked up. They didn't want to believe that she had been touched and abused by some by somebody that they loved and cared for. And later on, it became pro they became provable that it happened and, and that it actually did happen. And all those years, that little girl, where she wasn't believed and was ridiculed. And had to deal with that shame and, and all those horrible feelings that come with a young person trying to figure out what happened to them. It was proven that she was telling the truth. And that is, I, I, I equate it to this whole UFO uh, contactee situation. Because people close themselves off to what they will not accept in their mind to believe. You will only, people will only believe 
as much as their mind will allow them to believe. But, there, but people need to understand that things happen. And because it hasn't happened to you, it doesn't mean that it hasn't happened to many, many, many people throughout the history of mankind. Yeah, it's far more common than people realize this whole UFO thing. And I hear that all the time. People go through a double trauma. First, there's the experience and it completely shatters their worldview. Yes. And then they try to share it. And <laughs> does not always go well uh, oh, that's, how, 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 can you imagine can you imagine right now if you're not a contactee or someone that's ex had, had experience with these things can you imagine for decades of your life you're told that you're a liar you don't know what you're crazy you don't know what you're thinking about you don't know what you're talking about you're just looking for attention imagine decades of your life having to go through that yep that's why most of them remain silent Thank you. D Dolly, her, you know, Dolly Saffron, the subject of my latest book, told nobody. She's now in her 60s. She finally decided to come out because she had tried to tell people. And yeah, she suffered ridicule. It's funny. There was one case I researched, one of the early ones. I brought up the subject at work. I was newly researching. And the lady I worked right next to was like, oh, yeah, me and my whole family saw it. We were all watching this star-like object darting around. And in walks Dorothy. And if you met Dorothy, you'd love her. She's unfiltered, very outgoing, funny as hell. And she says, oh, one followed me and my mom and my best friend home from the library. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, we left at 9 o'clock. The library is five minutes from home. It was a saucer, silent, colored lights, dome. And uh, it's weird, Preston. We lived five minutes from the library. When we got home, it was 10.15. I don't know what happened to the time. I'm like, oh, Dorothy, you know, missing time. Have you heard of missing time? She's like, no, what are you talking about? This was back in the late 1980s. So I'm like, I want to talk to your friend. I want to talk to your mom. And I did. And her friend Carol was had a lot of fear. I think she was the target of this uh, encounter. I think they did were taken on board. At any rate, the point is uh, I talked to her mother and her mother first words out of her mouth is, I don't believe in UFOs. I'm like, that's okay. Just tell me what you saw. She says, well, I pulled up to the library and there was this saucer shaped object right across the street, hovering over the telephone wires. And it followed us right over our car, but I don't believe in UFOs. I'm like, well, what did it look like? Well, two pie pans together. There were little lights around it. I don't believe in UFOs though. And yeah. she, she prefaced that. I mean, she kept saying that over and over again, mm -hmm. refused to accept her experience. Yep. I've seen, I've talked to people like that too. They, they, they're, they're so afraid of being, you know, ridiculed and, and, and ostracized in the, in the, in the world. I was one of, I think one of the only times I've been convinced maybe or scared of what I had seen of not even what I was seeing is when I had Jim good all here. And I told him about what I seen flying over my neighborhood and was barely moving, going very slow. It was, I don't know if you heard me tell that story, Preston, but it's slow. It, what it was was a big flying V, and I thought it was a, a stealth bomber. It was moving so slow over the neighborhood. I had time to pull into my neighborhood, drive into my yard, get out of the truck, look at it, and then finally notice what I'm looking at. I went in the house, got a, one of my kids out of the shower. So she got a towel and stuff and came out and looked up. We're looking straight up at it at the bottom of this thing now. And she's saying, no, I've never seen nothing like that. And me neither. And there's a guy across the street, doesn't speak real good English, but he's looking at it with me. We're out both looking at this thing. And then it leaves. Okay. So it took a long time to go through the neighborhood and it was very, very low. Like I tell everyone that if my house is a regular story, it's just a one story house. But if there was two telephone poles, on top of my house stacked it would have knocked the top one over that's how low it was so i and it was as long as the whole neighborhood was wide it was like four blocks wide so i tell jim this and he says and i tell him it it was like a stealth bomber you know because it didn't make no noise <laughs> jim told me it's not what stealth means that he goes it's the paint <laughs> the paint is reflective so so that's what makes it a stealth bomber because if that thing would have been that close to your house 
He goes, it would have blown the windows out of your house. He goes, it's that loud. And there's no, there was nothing coming out. So I keep telling him, you know, then how did it do it? And he he tells me, you didn't see, you know, you didn't see a stealth bomber. So then I'm asking Jim Goodall, you know, well, then what the hell did I see? What was it then? And he just looked at me and said, it wasn't a stealth bomber. That's not what you seen, you know, and. (laughs) He wouldn't tell me what I seen, and I almost had a feeling like he could, <laughs> but he he didn't want to tell me. And, and I I remember thinking then, okay, now I I actually seen something that was impossible for me to be seeing because Jim said they can't move that slow; it'll fall right out of the sky. <laughs> they can't go that slow, and me and a few other people well me and my daughter and the guy across the street so there was three of us that were looking at this thing and when he told me that that wasn't a plane when i finally was convinced in other words somebody had like him though had to convince me that i wasn't seeing a jet that was just barely moving you know over my house um that that scared me so i i can feel that ladies i don't believe in ufos you know, it was a saucer with lights, but I don't believe in UFO. That's how I was when I would tell this story. I would always say, no, it, it wasn't a UFO. It, it was a, a stealth yeah. bomber. That's what I would always say <laughs> until Jim explained to me that it was impossible for it to be a stealth bomber. So now yeah. I don't say that no more, you know, but yeah, yeah. So I can understand that lady's feelings on saying, no, nah. hard, hard to accept. <laughs> And yeah. you're, you're lucky you had other witnesses with you because I've talked to people who are alone. And yeah, after you see something like that, you can really doubt your your own eyes. And I have to tell you, Sonny, when something's that close, there's a very good chance there are deeper levels of contact there. I mean, they're obviously showing themselves on purpose in a, a case like that. They're down there for a reason. So I don't know if you've had dreams that's associated with that or any other experiences following up or before, but <laughs> when something's that close, there's one, a reason. One, one thing that I, I, these guys know too, I told them it, it, it didn't feel like a dream. And it, it's still, even when I'm, <laughs> when I'm telling, when I'm thinking about it right now to tell you about it, it's like it happened last night and it, it was a long time ago. Now it's been years. Wow. Um, I, I, from what I remember is, is like, I just, I appear in this place and I'm grabbing a cell off of a hand cart. It's full of these cells. I'm just grabbing one of them and I turn, there's a frame in front of me and I'm putting these cells on this frame. It's a big frame and it's leaning on a walkway, you know, the, uh, a handrail and you know, where you're walking. Um, it, it's a big building, a big, huge, like hanger type thing. And there's people in here and they're way far away. And so there's other people in this place and there's two people above me. And they're the guys that are telling me where to put these cells. Uh, on the brain. I, I remember you telling me this last time. Yeah, right? that, that's, <laughs> that's, that happened around the same time. That would have been maybe, yeah, around the same time that I seen that, that that's, that's the only two things. Like <laughs> there was nothing else too much that i seen in that neighborhood that i couldn't explain Mm -hmm. and that that was the only time i've had that experience to where something felt like it happened to me that wasn't a dream but it it was a dream because i woke up in bed type thing (laughs) but i remember waking up and if i've told you before i was tired i was tired when i woke up like i was at work and then woke up in bed It, it was weird yeah I remember that now. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me wonder how many people have had like major encounter and just kind of passed it off, explained it away. Mm-hmm. One guy I interviewed, he had regular contact. He and his wife were driving home one day and this thing started following them, dropped down right in the road in front of them. And he could see right you know, through this huge porthole, two grays looking right at him. I mean, this thing was right there. And his wife refused to look. She looked the other direction and said, Let's go home. Drive home now. And this started a whole series of contacts. And he was outside once because he he thought it was fascinating. He liked it. And one of them just he's looking up these star-like objects. And he would mentally call out to him. And it it came and it dropped down right over his house. Huge saucer-shaped craft. So he runs inside and says, "Honey, honey, 
come outside, there's a UFO. And she turns to him and says, no, you know I don't like this stuff. <laughs> and refused to go outside and even look at it. So he was kind of alone with it. Such yeah. shame. And that's one of the things that we, when you said, Preston, about how you talk to family members, in my experience, many times people that experience uh, things that we're talking about, you know, they don't even tell their family, you know, because for, for the same fear yeah. that they don't even trust that they can, you know, that their family will believe them. Yeah, I was scandalized when I found out so many people in my own family had seen UFOs. My sister-in-law, she described this a close-up sighting, and it was about a year or two into, you know, me going out of my mind asking everybody. She says, "Well, I did have one other experience." I'm like, oh, "Okay, what?" And she described how she had was walking outside her home. This is in Van Nuys, California, in the late '70s, late at night, and uh, she's with her dog, and she's just walking down the sidewalk, and going by Stag Street Elementary School when she saw two kids, what she thought were two kids, standing in the courtyard in front of the school under the spotlight. And she looks over at them and uh, they're bald. And they have little blue jumpsuits on. They're really short. And she walks right up next to them thinking, you know, are these kids wearing masks? What's going on? And turns and looks at them. She's about 10 feet away from them at this point. She says they weren't human. And I'm like, what did they look like? And she described your typical gray. She said they had very large, oversized heads, big, dark eyes, olive green jumpsuits. She said they appeared to be floating an inch or two off the ground, stared right at her, scared the living daylights out of her. And she had never heard of grays. She had mm -hmm. read zero books on UFOs. This wasn't in the media really at all at the time. So she didn't even really go there. She just knew they weren't human and described them in detail. I'm like, why didn't you tell me this? She said, would you have believed me? She, she told no one this. I was the first person she told. So it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that most people keep this stuff secret. Hey, Preston, today we've asked you some, some questions that I don't normally hear other podcasts ask you about. And I really appreciate you, um, you know, putting up with them and um, being so honest and giving us your uh, heartfelt opinions <coughs> on, on these things. I do want to ask you one more thing, though, and that is, what do you wish, you know, you get a lot of questions thrown at you, but like, is there anything that you ever wish people would ask you about? Like, like, like what, what do you want people to know? <laughs> I don't know. I've I've ever been asked that. Um, I'd have to think about that one. <laughs> well, I mean, because we hear the same. You know, we we hear we hear the stories and everybody about you know the aliens and you know the. the I just wonder, like, sometimes there's a message that you want to get out, and there's this. And I I'll bring up that UFO Twitter thing again because it's so prevalent in this community and it's so dominant. With it seems to be you know uh, the the tone of if you will of where we are in the whole disclosure you know movement. I just wonder, like, what what do you wish people, you know, knew or, or were talking about in regards to this subject, these subjects? Yeah, I would say that uh, that I wish people would understand that they are not here to take over or hurt people. There's a lot of fear surrounding the subject, which I get. It can be very scary if you know these guys appear in your bedroom and suddenly you find yourself on board and you're being physically examined. Right. Uh, but it, if you just step back and take an objective look at what actually happens to people who are having direct contact, it's not malevolent at all. It's the opposite. It's very mm -hmm. much benevolent. Yep. I came to that conclusion fairly quickly. It took me a little bit of research. But when I started getting all kinds of healing accounts, I thought, mm -hmm. hmm, that's kind of interesting. Why isn't this getting attention? I wish that would get a lot more attention than it does. People are like, oh, you know, this is scary. They had needles and I didn't like it. I'm like, well, what happened to you? I said, well, I did have, you know, my arthritis disappear or <laughs> they cured me of a kidney stones. Uh, and I'm just, there's a long, long list. Pretty much, I don't, I won't say every major researcher, but most for sure has healing cases. And that's when I really started to take a second look at this. I'm like, huh, well, this is interesting. And people are taken down to the engine room and told how these craft work. They're taken up to what I would call the observation deck. This is very common. People will be 
in the craft and suddenly the walls turn transparent and they look outside and there's a star field or there's the moon or Saturn or there's the earth way down there. Uh, and they are very much interested in teaching people about our own abilities, our own psychic abilities. There's a very yes. prominent spiritual aspect to these yes. counters that the nuts and bolts folks absolutely yes won't talk about and that's what i appreciated so much the last interview i watched with you and i think it was ufo your uap uh podcast i wish i could remember the exact name I, i'm sorry to those guys but i loved that interview it was just like a few days ago but you brought up the whole spirituality aspect and those guys have open minds too on that podcast and i you know they 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 were listening and they were very interested in what you're talking about i think personally that we're that if people would just, for me, thank you again for indulging my opinion on, on this. If people just would listen and hear experiencers and contactees, that is the best thing they could do. You're not going to find out what you want from the from the NASA. You're not going to find out what you want from the, <laughs> go, the government in Washington D.C. Please listen and hear people stories and life stories that's when you're going to find out what you want to know then it may be then maybe you might even start you know opening your, yourself up to maybe experiences you might have had that maybe you've tucked away and put in put somewhere in a safety uh, silo but you have got we've got to listen to people and their stories and that's what i appreciate so much about you and the books that you write the way you go out and tell these stories on these podcasts, you know you're going to take criticism. You know you're going to get you know haters, and I really, really appreciate it, man. I wanted to take this um, this morning to tell you that. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, that that's another thing I would underline is if a person wants to have an experience, go out there and look for them. Do CE fives. You know, join a CE five group. I think you'll be surprised how six. I did it, and I had a bunch of sightings. And meditate. You know. The ETs want you to reach out to them. And if you are willing to just put in a little effort, meditate and uh, call out. Get, to out them. For, get out from behind your keyboard and your computer and do something yourself. <laughs> You'd be surprised, man. You'd be surprised what you'll find out. Yeah, it's not hard. Um, if you want to have all these experiences, I mean, if you want to learn how to have astral travel, there's a lot of literature out there and you can do it. I got really into that. And that's all connected to this because contactees as a rule are very psychically aware. And this is part, this is one of the main ET agendas for sure. I mean, they pull people on board to sort of maintain their genetics and heal them and watch over them. It's very much positive experience, not as it's portrayed in the media, which is very fear-based and loves the scary story. But it's all about spirituality and us becoming fully realized human beings because we do have the ability to do astral travel and past life recall and clairvoyance and hands-on healing and physical levitation which sounds crazy i both i wrote a book on levitation because we had a family friend who claimed to have flown as a child I'm like mary are you kidding me she's like honest to god and i asked everyone i knew and they all looked at me like i was crazy until I found another lady, a friend of my sister-in-law's, who claimed to have levitated again as a child and ended up doing a lot of research in it. But I found out that this is connected to the whole contact experience as well. Whitley Strieber had a, a levitation experience. Bud Hopkins, you know, the abduction researcher, had several cases. Uh, Stephen Greer talked about it. He levitated following his onboard experience. I started asking other contactees. That's now a question I asked them. I asked Dolly that, Dolly Saffron. I'm like, I don't suppose you've ever had a levitation experience. She's like, well, as a matter of fact, yeah. You know, she had several. She was like two years old. Or so when she wanted to levitate up to this shelf in the closet that she uh, had wondered what was up there, and she did. And that turned out to be the first of several levitation experiences. But telekinesis, uh, psychic reading, channeling, all of this is connected to it. We can do this. It's not supernatural. That's it's right. Not paranormal. It's just we don't fully understand it. It's a natural human abilities, all of this. And you can do it. <laughs> I love that, man. I love it. Yeah, it's a great message, Preston. Thank you. 
And we also, uh, I wanted to let everyone know, Preston Dunn has an awesome YouTube channel. And uh, it's my favorite thing to do on Saturday mornings is wake up and find out what is the latest upload from Preston because it's always cool to just chill on the couch and listen to these stories that, that he tells. <clears throat> They're awesome. So uh, his channel is actually just called Preston Dennett, and I put that – oh, I didn't. It's right there in the chat room now, and I think I do have it in the description below also. Oh, and thank you, Melissa. You actually put the same thing in there. Appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I had one more question. Brassel woke up early and uh, is joining us in the chat room. Uh, he says, Preston, have you found any correlation to the experiences in atheism? Do they go hand in hand or does it seem to matter at all, our beliefs? Um, well, that's kind of a trick question. No, they contact people of all religions, men and women. And you know, I, I actually analyze all the cases I have. It's equally divided between men and women. It's all different. I won't even say race, ancestries, because we are one race. Uh, there's very little difference between all of us here on Earth. That's not connected to blood type or anything. And I've talked to people who are very religious and people who are atheists, and your belief system can play a role in how you interpret this experience for sure. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, it will have an effect on your belief system. And there's a number of people who were very profoundly religious who moved away from that. Uh, because their religion was so strict that it didn't really have room to categorize this type of experience. And that's more of the pattern I do see. People will move away from, you know, strict, organized, fundamental religions. Uh, and I think they would tend towards, I don't, I don't want to say atheism either. Mm -hmm. because, uh, I don't see that as a pattern either. I think people become what I would call more spiritual. And uh, I asked Dolly about this because uh, she said that's often a question people will ask the ETs. She's on board when the ETs will scoop people up for an exam and a checkup and a you know <laughs> guidance. And often the first things out of people's mouths is, do you believe in God? And they're very gracious in not offending a person's belief system, uh, but will explain that they believe basically in science and spirituality and in the what they call the all mind that the universe itself is to a degree conscious mm -hmm. um, very deeply into that I, I describe it quite a bit more in detail uh, but yeah religion is, is, oh your microphone again Preston. Uh, sorry Re religion does play a role in how people interpret these experiences and uh, I think uh, we definitely see that. I mean, I've talked to people who are absolutely sure that they had an encounter with a demon or an angel. And after interviewing them, it becomes clear that this is more along the lines of extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And I think that is is what we are dealing with here. People like us from other planets, biological beings, there's all kinds of talk about, oh, maybe they're time travelers. Maybe they're interdimensional beings who are wearing a mask and masquerading as extraterrestrials. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's a mistake to, I mean, a lot of stuff gets thrown under the UFO umbrella. But if you look at the totality of the evidence, I think it's very clear that we're dealing with people, beings very much like us, more alike us than different. They're mm -hmm. not Aliens. They are people, and uh, they're humanoids. Some look exactly like us, and the evidence is overwhelming that they're they have craft. You know, <laughs> they wear clothes, uh, they eat, they sleep. They are very much like us, and right down the line, just perhaps more spiritually advanced, uh, more technologically advanced, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, they are people like us. Uh, Anthony from the chat says, why do you think that they are taking us to be examined? Uh, I think it's health related. Uh, honestly, I think that is the main thing. They, our relationship to them is much closer than people realize. The one message that most contactees will get is we are you, you are us, we are all one. 
and they will take people. That's the main purpose behind onboard uh, encounters is to maintain people's genetics. We're having a lot of genetic damage right now due to gamma radiation and the failing of Earth's magnetic fields. Almost as a rule, contactees are warned about the environmental changes we're going through and our warlike ways and the dangers of nuclear proliferation, environmental destruction. And they are examining people and protecting our genetic lines. This is why they follow certain families. Uh, as people who have repeated contact, most likely their parents have, their grandparents, aunts and uncles, their children. This follows family lines and they're doing the best to protect the you know, the best genetics we have. There's one case I'll cite that kind of really demonstrates this, which was in, I think, one, my latest, one of my latest YouTube videos. This gentleman from Gainesville, Florida, his name is Jim, uh, had a visitation by the Greys, and at the time he was suffering from a hernia. He was like, you guys are gonna keep contacting me. Can you do any, anything about this hernia? And he said, yes, we will repair this. We know that of this condition that you speak of and we will repair it. And they pulled out this little device and they did. And he said, why are you contacting me? What's up with this? Why me? And they said, we are interested in your genetic potential to live a long time. Direct quote from McGray. And that really rang a bell with him because his grandfather was 106 years old. His aunt had lived to... 103, I think it was, or 96. Um, he, he's got a lot of longevity in his family. And this just goes to show how interested the ETs are in what John Mack called health upgrades. I can't tell you how many contactees I've talked to who have enjoyed very good health. And that really makes me wonder when you think about how longevity has increased over the past 200 years or so. Because you go back 200 years and the average lifespan was what the four in your 30s or 40s and it's double that so i think it speaks to the et agenda they are maintaining our health as best as they can uh, in a situation where our planet is beginning to have some real problems oh that's interesting well i don't think we have any more questions from the chat room spooky did you see any more i don't think Everyone's typing in all caps right now, so it's hard to see if mm -hmm. there's any questions. But um, we are at the top of the hour, Preston, so thank you so much for being here. I was uh, very excited to see you on the calendar once again, and it's always a very good pleasure to have a conversation with you early in the morning. <laughs> hey. I love talking about this stuff. I can do it for hours. So. The only yeah. thing that disappointed me about today's show was that Preston told me he's no longer in L.A. I was hoping that me and Preston could meet for a coffee or tea or something, man. Hey, I still have family there, so I'll let okay, you let know. me know when you're going to. Yeah, please let me know when you're going to be there. All right. Oh, that would be amazing. How <laughs> spooky mm -hmm. and Preston meet up. <laughs> Some coffee. Yeah, Preston, thank you, man. You're absolutely brilliant. And I cannot thank you enough for the for for the way that you um, open your heart and your minds to people and tell their stories. And then you come on these podcasts and just and just, you know, lay it all out. And you, you know, whatever happens, happens. But thank you, man, so much. I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you, dude. And we'll have. Uh... Oh, sorry, Sonny. Oh, I was just telling him. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. We always appreciate your time, dude. You're a great guest. Yeah, That's man. Nice we'll have Cassie reach back out to you and see if you want, would like to do it again. <laughs> so thanks, good. Preston. We'll talk to you again next time. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Have, have a good one. Bye. Wow. Thank you, Spooky, for asking all the good questions. You were asking some I fire love questions. I Preston. <laughs> Preston's awesome. Yep. Yeah, he's, you know uh, what it was, man? It was just the last time I saw him on that the, the podcast a few days ago. It just really made me think about, you know, when I saw people's comments saying, yeah, you guys don't ask the right questions. You need to be harder on these people. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> F that. If you don't like the way somebody's doing their podcast, don't watch it. But don't be telling people how did they should do their podcast. You, you want people to do a podcast a certain way? Go start your own podcast. That's right. 
It's like people trying to tell you which podcast to watch and shit. <laughs> Don't be telling me what to do. I'm a grown ass man. That's right. I by now I have figured out in my life who I want to be associated with and who not. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is like these shows. I are... am between two asses right now. <laughs> You're between <laughs> four asses right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're in between four asses, Spooky. For everybody that's just listening to the podcast, uh, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie comes I do, backstage. I do love and, them cakes. Oh, she's not back there anymore. I guess she's not going to take it down. <laughs> Jeez. Jamie just comes in and starts putting in overlays. I like mm-hmm. the goat one. That one's cool. And then we made this one for Gorilla Gamer. GG. Oh, put a GG up there. But yeah, guys, so that was uh, an interview with Preston Dennett. And uh, that was our third time with them. We have uh, two other episodes with him on our channel. Both of them are with uh, Trippy Times, Josh Casey. Oh. And uh, the second one that we did, Josh lined up, was actually with Preston and Sev Talk. So if you haven't seen that one, go over and check that out. Dude, I almost pulled up some pictures that uh, Trippy Time shared with us of, of some orbs that he had taken pictures of. I almost put them, pulled them out on this podcast. Oh, that would have been fun. But 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 but, but we're gonna I'm gonna save it for another one. Everybody's got something to look forward to. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh my God, Melissa, Chad's ass is bigger than mine. I can't. Hey-ho! You can't be claiming that. What are you doing? Girl. A lot of people are gonna want proof. <laughs> Shit. Uh, Uh, you got got a show to do friday and i'm not gonna be here either i'm gonna be at work what you talking about willis you're gonna be interviewing steve ward (laughs) here's what you're doing okay information jockey at at the mothman museum the only mothman Mothman. museum the only mothman museum that's what it says Check your messenger. You got a pick in there. Oh, hey, jeez, Jamie's back. back. Yeah, she spells it. <laughs> uh, what do you just want? Just delete Jamie? Twitter. Oh, she wanted me to pull up her comment, and we oh. weren't doing it, so she just comes in here and does it. Just delete Twitter. <laughs> and she pulled up Lynn's comment. Hey, Lynn, thank you so much for becoming a member of the Chad Smith podcast during the episode. Appreciate that. Uh, and Diesel Girl, same with you. Thank you so much for becoming a supporter plus of the Chad Smith Podcast. Really appreciate you guys. Where's the... Uh, there it is. Thank you. Chad, I have a fat ass. Well, I typed that, so, I mean, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. I can't even kick her out of there. You won't even let you remove her from backstage. I would just like to say thank you for waiting to Preston bounced out before we started this debauchery. Yeah, Preston, if you're still watching... Um, oh, he's not watching this. None of this <laughs> happened. None of this happened during the show. Uh, um, what else do we have to say? We have uh, uh, cheaper memberships now. We have um, a $2 and a $5 membership. I think Cassie wants some disco music. Oh, Cassie wants disco music. She's got some this, dancing, dancers up there in the chat. This ass ain't going to shake on its own. Throw dollars to watch, you, watch it bounce. Oh, my God, oh, Jamie. Man. We have hit the gutter. Uh, blame that on Jamie. <laughs> uh, we don't have any. I don't think we have any disco jams. We can play this one while we're getting out of here. Uh, we do have a Thursday show called Smutcast. If anybody wants to hang out with us on Thursday, we uh, check out some not safe for work videos from TikTok and go over some not safe for work funny news stories. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit more laid back, fun show. So check us out on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8, what is it, 8 Pacific? Yep, 8 Pacific. Pacific time. And join Spooky on Friday, interviewing a Mothman dude. Thank you, thank you. That's right. On Paranormal Chop Shop on YouTube. And uh, what else? What else you got, Spooky? The only thing I got is. If you don't, if you're not subscribed or whatever they call it, subbed to this show right here, <laughs> there's something wrong with you. Absolutely. That's right. You gotta be rocking your UFO, UFO garage. garage. Be UFO there. Garage. It's where all the cool kids are, yo. 
you know. Bam. You can't even get this anymore. It's not even on the website. Oh man, you lucky. Whoa. Oh. Oh. Just a spaceship, y'all. It's just a spaceship, y'all. No, no, nobody hit the report button. With a big ass pair of balls for landing gear. Whoa. <laughs> Peace. He really went there. <laughs> All right. Well, if that's all we got, what about um, we got Bobby's Cryptic Corner today? Tuesday. Bobby's is- Cryptic Corner. Yeah, today is Tuesday. The last time I watched Bobby's Cryptic Corner, <laughs> there was no Bobby. <laughs> well, maybe today we'll have Bobby. I don't know. Let's make sure that they're on today. You'd think that Jamie would... Oh, wait, what's she say? Cryptid Corner tonight, everyone. Be there or I'll haunt your dreams. All right, there we go. So Jamie says that there is a show tonight. Bobby's Cryptid Corner on that one time I was abducted by aliens. Please make sure to go over there and take your chances on that channel. I'll put the link in the chat right now. (laughs) No, we love those girls over there. They're awesome. All right, Spooky, I guess that's it. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you, man. This was a good show. Odd house. Right. Something's getting odd around here eventually. Uh, <laughs> We're going to get it out eventually. Just in time for the holidays. Just in time for Christmas mm-hmm. or New Year's. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys. Love you. Peace. Peace out. It sound right, boys.